Good morning, Crow Hill. Thanks for coming this morning. If you'll please stand, we're going to start our worship. Come set your rule and reign. breathe. Thank you, Lord. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, this morning, the Lord laid upon my heart, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives, and do not let your heart be troubled, and do not be afraid. Uh, I told first service, I don't know if the Lord gave me that scripture for myself or for someone out there. But at this time, I'd like us just to bow our heads for a moment and take a moment. If you know someone who needs peace right now, I'm asking that you just pray for them. Or if you need peace at the moment, just reach out to the Lord.
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the peace. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for being there, no matter what, on the mountain, in the valley. Lord, I pray if anyone's out there this morning that needs peace, I pray that they feel it, that they feel you, that they feel the presence of you this morning in your church and even as they leave the doors. Lord, if anyone needs healing, I pray over them. You and you alone can heal them, Lord. You and you alone can give us peace and love. I pray this in your precious name. Amen.
again, thank you for your peace. Lord, I pray that someone claim that peace this morning. I pray that someone claim that healing this morning. And Lord, thank you for your love that never, ever fails. In your precious name, amen. You may be seated. Acts chapter 19, verse 23. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. Man, what a great opening line. I hear it read in my mind by Alec Guinness as he's like, I sense a great disturbance in the force. And it's all about the way. And if you're just joining us today, you're like, well, wait, hold on. What way? About what time? I'm so glad you asked. If you would, open up your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 19. That's where we're going to be today. If you're not familiar with your Bible or you don't know where to find the book of Acts, uh, don't worry. We'll always help you get there. You can either turn in your table of contents and find the page number or the book of Acts is about three quarters of the way through your Bible. You'll find the New Testament. First four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four big books that tell the story of Jesus. And then we come to the book of Acts. Uh, the book that tells the story of the spreading of the news of Jesus and the, uh, the beginning of the church. We've been walking through the book of Acts, following this journey of Paul and the disciples telling the world about Jesus. And now we come to Acts chapter 19, or at least the second half of it. Paul is in Ephesus, the ancient city. We've been there for about three weeks. Paul has been there for about three years the city of Ephesus is this gateway harbor to Italy and to Greece and to the entire Roman Empire. It sits on the western coast of modern-day Turkey against the Aegean Sea. It's the fourth largest city in the empire. It's known for, for its amazing architecture, and it's known for its dark magic. We've been walking through and talking about this for the last couple weeks. If you missed those, you can always check them out online if you want to be able to catch up. Otherwise, Acts chapter 19, verse 23, about that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. We're in Ephesus. I wanted to show you some photos of Ephesus last week, and I, I didn't. So I decided I'd make up for this week by actually showing you some photos. Uh, this is Ephesus. Uh, it is gorgeous. You want to visit Ephesus. I want to visit Ephesus. Let's all book a plane there together and head there. Uh, the beautiful water, the mountains in the background, the cities. You can see where the cruise ships begin to set in uh, for their Greek and Mediterranean cruises. For people who want to come and visit the ancient city of Ephesus, this is what it looks like today. I don't have any pictures of what it looked like 2000 years ago during the time of our story because I didn't have a camera back then. Um, but we've talked about two scenes in Ephesus, two of these settings that we're going to revisit today. Number one is the amphitheater in Ephesus, which still stands today. This amphitheater could hold 24,000 people, and it'll be the setting for our study today. It'll be the setting for a mob scene and for an impromptu worship scene it all surrounds, this, this great disturbance all surrounds this temple of the goddess Artemis, this mother of fertility. This is a picture of the temple as it stood about 2,000 years ago. It was one of the ancient wonders uh, of the ancient world, one of the seven ancient wonders of the world back then. Uh, this is what it probably looked like back then. It's an artist rendition because uh, you can see it now, it has 132 columns. Each one is 15 tons. It was a massive work of this architectural engineering. And if you were from the typical city back in that day, which typically hosted about 100 to 500 people, this would have been mind-boggling. And you would have walked into the empire, and this is what would have greeted you. And you would have gone back singing the praises of Rome to your people. This is what it looks like today, on the other hand. Uh, it's not as quite as glorious. These are the remnants and the pieces that they found, which they've been able to piece back together. The temple was cannibalized to make room for other structures as time progressed, and the cult of Artemis fell out of practice. And Ephesus now is known for its dark magic. 
It's known for its trinkets, its idols, its little things you can buy. And last week we talked about the beginning of chapter 19 where God said, listen, I'm not into your superstition. I'm not into your voodoo, but I'll play that game to catch your attention. And as a result, we read in Acts chapter 19, verse 20, where it says, In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew greatly in power. And throughout the city of Ephesus and the entire country around it, lives are being changed. Marriages are being healed. And to this day, we are seeing people following the way. And now it leads to a great disturbance. What is the way? You see, the way was the ancient name for Christianity. And I wrote down in your notes a couple things that I want you to remember about the way that made it stand out in that day and time. And so, if you will, on your, on your notes, I wrote two words, the and way, so that you could follow along as we talk about the way. Next to the, I want you to write this, the one and only, the one and only. You see, in a world of pluralistic beliefs, in a world of many gods and goddesses, these guys claim to follow the one and only way. They claim to follow the only God. How many gods are there in the Roman Empire? Well, there's one, two, three. There are thousands of gods that they can follow, minor and major deities, depending on where you go. And just in Ephesus, there is worship of over a hundred gods. And these people have the arrogance to claim that theirs is the only real one? Uh, That's their claim. You have to decide whether or not you want to believe it. Second of all, they're members of not just the, but the way. Next to the way, I want you to write this. It's a direction, not a destination. The way is a direction that they move in, not a destination. You see, they weren't called the heaven as if that was their destination. They weren't called the church because that's where they went to on the weekends. Instead, they're called the way because they were known for a way of life. It's not just about where you go on the weekend. It's about your daily walk. It's about your daily direction. It's about the way in which you live and their lives are being changed and they're living now in a different way. And they weren't known because they went to a building, the, 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 the temple of Tyrannus or whatever. And they weren't called the people of Tyrannus. They were called the people of the way because they were living in a new way. They looked different from everybody else. What would it look like, church? What would it look like if we were actually able to change the impression that this city has of the church? As if they didn't just look at the church like that's that building up on the hill by loaf and jug where a bunch of people go on Sunday morning. But what if they were to begin looking at the church saying, those are people who walk in a different way. They're people who live in a different way. And what if we were known not by where we went to on Sunday morning at 1030, but what if we were known as people who lived in a different way from everywhere else? We're already gearing up and getting ready for Bailey Day. For those of you who are new to the area or don't know what Bailey Day is, Bailey Day is a big festival we hold here in Bailey. And last year it was really neat because before I was even up, we began planning and making preparations for the church's participation in Bailey Day. And last year we went and we sold pulled pork and and we just served the people. And then after worship on the Sunday afterwards, we only had one service at nine o'clock. And then we actually took the 1030 service off and we all went down in mass to uh, down to Bailey Day to help clean up. And, And the people were not prepared for such a massive cleanup effort. And we got done what they were planning on spending the day doing in less than an hour. And the people were so impressed by the way that the church showed up. They already have contacted us in preparation for Bailey Day this year, wanting to know what our, what our like, participation level is going to be. And I love this. And one of the things they're debating and they're talking about was they're going back to Bailey Days, plural, where it could take place over two days a Saturday and a Sunday. And they said, if we met on a Sunday, what would your participation level be? And we simply let them know, on Sundays we worship. On Sundays we, we worship, this is the way. And they said, but we'd be very willing to participate on Sunday. Could we actually take our worship and move it downtown and actually worship at the beginning of Bailey Day? And, and they were nervous about that. They were afraid of that. And they were nervous about that. And they didn't say yes. And they haven't said no. There's still a lot up in the air. And we're at the beginning preparation of the stage. And we're like, could could we go down? And they thought about it. And they said, well, if you came down, 
We, we would want it to be more of a cowboy church. Your pastor's from Texas. He understands cowboy church, right? And, and I got to be honest, I, I come from cowboy stock. And I said, what's, but what's the difference in cowboy church and a church church? I'm like, if I ride in on a horse, does that count? What are they looking for? Which would be awesome. And, and, and they said, well, cowboy church, you, you don't talk about Jesus. You, you just talk about love God and love your neighbor and leave it be. And I said, well, there, there's a problem with that. You see, that whole love God and love your neighbor thing, that, that was phrased by Jesus. <laughs> and, and if I say that without giving him credit, that's called plagiarism and I'll be in trouble. <laughs> you see, we, we can't do that. And what they were really saying was, we don't want the judgmental condemnation that comes with church. And we said, when was the last time you came to church? They said, well, we, we don't go to church. We don't want that judgmental condemnation. And we said, so you haven't been to church, but you're judging us. I'm afraid we're going to judge you at the same time. You see, this is the problem. The church is not known for the love, the hope, and the peace that, that Shelley was talking about of Jesus. We're known for something else. What if we were known not for where we go on Sunday mornings, what if we were known for the way we walk in love and peace and hope? What if we were known for the way we walk in a different direction from the world? And today there's another group. There's another church that's going to be involved in the scene in Acts chapter 19. And it's the cult of Artemis. It's the story of the temple of Artemis. And before I get into what happened, you, you have these two groups who really don't even come into conflict together. There's only a conflict on one side. And the cult of Artemis and the way are going to come together with their difference of beliefs. And before we really get into it, I want to ask you, who's right? Who is right? I don't want to impose upon you the idea that there was one God, but how many Artemisians do you know today? How many people follow Artemis today? See, we, we get a lot of prayer requests each week asking us to pray for your family or for whatever. And, and, and I've never gotten a prayer request that says, hey, pray for my brother. He is just following Artemis hard. And we want to tell him about Jesus. That, that's just not one that happens. And we're going to see a fight break out in the city of Ephesus. And we're going to watch how the church doesn't respond or react. And I'm like, really? In fact, the church won't do anything in the this, in this study that we're doing today. And 2,000 years later, we're going to see how Christianity, how the way has spread to the corners of the earth. And today I want to talk to you about how Christianity is something you have to share, not something you have to fight over. In our culture today, the number of fights that we get in, the number of fights we see the church in on social media and everywhere. And I want to, as we study this, I want to show you the way. Because I think we're going to learn something in the study about the way that you win over a culture who is avidly against you. And I think there's going to be some great stuff for you and I to learn about how we impact a culture and how we impact a city in the way of following Jesus. And I think it's going to, I think it's going to surprise you. Okay. That's enough preamble. Acts chapter 19, verse 24 begins with this. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made shrines of silver of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. So he makes these miniature idols out of silver, and he sells them as little trinkets to people and souvenirs to people as they come through Ephesus. And he called all of us together and his fellow workers and related trades and said, You know, my friends, we've received a good deal of income from our business. And you see in here how now this fellow Paul has convinced a large numbers of people, circle, highlight, or underline that large numbers, of people here in Ephesus, and in practically the whole providence of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands aren't gods at all. It's like we made them up or something, um, which is actually what he says. Um, there's a danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be desecrated. And the goddess herself, who we worship throughout the providence of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. Demetrius calls a town hall meeting and he goes, guys, we've made some good money, but we are losing business. 
Have you checked out the quarterly statements compared to last year? We're not doing so hot. And I think I found this, the problem. You see, the issue is not that we're like not making as good of statues anymore. The issue is not quality control. The issue is now we have all these people coming to be of the way. And these one godders are coming up saying that these guys are not gods. People used to come to Ephesus and buy our souvenirs, but now people come to Ephesus and I'm like, hey, you want a souvenir? God is Artemis. And they're like, no, I'm a one godder. I've already got one. I don't need this one. And they're like, and we are losing business. And the problem is people of the way, people who are following one God. And he makes this tremendous claim that the entire providence of Asia, which is all of modern day Turkey, he goes, are all falling away and following this one God. And it's a tremendous claim until you remember that Ephesus is this major port harbor where everybody comes to for trade and they are learning about the way of Jesus and going back to their own towns. And now more and more people are these one godders. And he makes this twofold appeal to the people who he's working with. One, he goes, isn't this impacting you personally? He goes, hey guys, have you lost money? It's impacting our wallets. It's impacting our financial portfolio. It's impacting the bottom line. You see, everybody is okay with Jesus until he asks us to sacrifice something. And he goes, this Jesus is costing us something. His second appeal is this. He goes, our culture, Ephesus, is known for following Artemis. And these one wayers are coming in. And he goes, and they're changing our culture. They're changing who we are. Friends, I want to let you know today, we're not up against Artemisians. But this is the same claim that people will make about not following Jesus in our culture today. Number one, they say, hey, if you follow Jesus, it's going to cost you something. You'll have to give up something. That way of life that you're living, you might have to surrender something to God. If you follow Jesus, what will it cost you? And number two, isn't this the direction our culture is going in anyway? You see, this is who we are. It's how we live. It's my culture. It's just part of who I am. And you're asking me to change to follow this Jesus? And people do not want to walk in the way. Do you know how odd you're going to be in this culture if you follow God and you actually walk in his way? Do you know what that will cost you? And it's the same reason we're afraid to follow today. And then he ends with this weird statement at the end, though. He says, but also, he goes, not only is this costing us personally, not only is it impacting our culture, but also there is a danger that the great goddess of Artemis will be discredited and that the goddess herself who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia will be robbed of her divine majesty. Circle, highlight, or underline that. He goes, don't you realize our goddess will be robbed of her divine majesty? Friends, I want to let you know something. If you worship a God who can be robbed of its majesty, in the words of the great theologian Hulk, puny God. been afraid that your church, your Jesus, your God, have you ever felt the need to defend God? I want to let you know, if you worship a God who can be robbed of his divine majesty, that is a puny God. And we're going to watch a story of a church who did not do anything, and yet the name of Jesus not only endures, but spreads throughout the world because Jesus endures. And he sustains his church. And I love this. Verse 28 says, When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And soon the whole city was in an uproar. People seized Gaius and Arsacitacus, uh, who was Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. <laughs> and they rushed them into the theater together. So they grabbed these two guys, Gaius and uh, Arsacitacus, it sounds like a dinosaur. I don't know. <laughs> you see, remember, Paul was not traveling alone. It was not Paul's ministry. It was not the ministry of the pastor. But there was an entire church. In, it was a movement of God at this. And they grabbed two of these guys from Macedonia, which is modern day Greece, who came along and were partnering with Paul, who were spreading the gospel and making this happen. And they rushed them into the amphitheater. 
says Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, remember the church is even infiltrating into the government levels at this point, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. Uh, This is why we have Life Group. Have you ever wanted to do something dumb? Have you ever wanted to do something that was not a good idea? See, this is also why we have elders here at the church. Because occasionally I'm like, hey, what if we did this and I need men of God surrounding me saying, don't do that. Like, this is not a good idea. It says in verse 32, the entire assembly was in confusion. Some of them were shouting one thing, some another. Most didn't even know why they were there. Where do you go in a place big enough to hold an entire city? Where do you go in a place big enough to have this kind of riot? You have an amphitheater that'll hold 24,000 people and the amphitheater fills and the people are beginning to shout as one man, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Some people are shouting one thing. Some people are shouting another. Some people just show up because there's an angry mob. Like, I don't even know why I'm here. I'm just angry. Have you noticed that in our culture? People may not even know why they're here. They're just just angry. What are you angry about? I'm done at everything. I'm angry. And Paul, this is his gig. This is his shtick. This is what he does. He stands before the people and he preaches the word of God and he goes, let me at them. And I bet Paul is probably thinking back to Acts chapter 18. Do you remember when he was in Corinth and he decided to give it up? And he's like, I'm not going to follow this anymore. He goes, it's too hard. And everybody's just coming at me and I'm done. And in Acts chapter 18, God speaks to Paul. And he goes, Paul, do not be afraid and do not stop speaking. It's been five years since he received that message. And that's become his mantra, his everyday expression. Do not be afraid. Do not stop speaking. Do not be afraid. Do not stop speaking. And it's the way he lives his life. So now there's an angry mob before him. And he goes, I'm not afraid. I'm going to speak. And one of his boys puts him in a chokehold. He goes, no, you're not, bro. He goes, the people here don't even know why they're here. They're just angry. You can't reason with people who cannot be reasoned with. Paul, if you go out there, they're going to lynch you. And they hold him back. And the Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front. Alexander was probably the head uh, of the Jewish synagogue at the time. And they shouted instructions to him. Everybody's like, oh, do this, do this. Get control of this crowd. And he motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, circle, highlighter, underline this, they shouted in unison for two hours, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Paul is there. He goes, guys, let me out. And his life group grabs him and says, Paul, you're going to get killed. We know better than this one. These people can't be reasoned with. And the Jews decide to seize the moment. You see, these are the same Jews who have kicked the way out of their synagogue three years ago. They've been trying to kick the way out of the city for years. And the way has only grown and grown and grown, larger than anything their puny synagogue could have held at the time. And now that the way has grown... They decide this is the way to get the whole city to get rid of the way. And Alexander goes up, and the racism card is played hard here. And they realize he's a Jew, and they don't want to hear it. The Jews have already been kicked out of Rome, and they say, we're not listening. And the place erupts for the next two hours. Great as Artemis of the Ephesians, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. And this amphitheater becomes a worship center. Not for the one God, for Artemis, the goddess of fertility, the goddess of the hunt. And the city leaders at this point, realizing this is not going well, we're about to lose control of the crowd. You see, Rome rules at this day and age with an iron fist. There is no demonstration. There are no assemblies, especially over areas of riots. Rome won't put up with it. There is no such thing as insurrection in their kingdom because they march in and they quell it immediately. And the city officials realize we're in danger of Ephesus going into lockdown. We have to get this into hand. So in verse 35, it says this, the city clerk quieted the crowd and said, fellow Ephesians, doesn't the whole world know the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and her image, which fell for heaven? He goes, guys, why are you yelling? He goes, everybody knows what we're known for. Calm down. He goes, therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down. Do not do anything rash. You've brought these men here, though they have neither robbed our temples nor blasphemed our goddess. Circle, highlight, or underline that. It says, guys, you, you drugged these guys here 
they haven't done anything. You essentially kidnapped these, these guys and he goes, you drugged them in here. What have they done? And then he says this, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, then the courts are open, as are the pro councils. Press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be handled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened here today. If that were the case, we would not be able to account for the commotion since there is no reason for it. Circle, highlight, or underline that in your Bible. And after he said this, he dismisses the assembly. The city council member, the, the equivalent of the mayor, shows up. And he goes, guys, what you're doing is illegal. You've kidnapped somebody. I remember back to the Muppet movie, the new one. Uh, there's a moment where Fozzie Bear kidnaps Jack Black because the Muppets Theater is going to close and they're going to like hoodwink Jack Black into hosting the Muppets show. And Kermit the Frog goes, you kidnapped Jack Black. And Fozzie goes, which is more illegal, like shutting down the Muppet Theater or kidnapping Jack Black? And he goes, kidnapping Jack Black. And this is the moment that occurs to me. He goes, you kidnapped these guys. He goes, you brought them in here. And he goes, now you guys are rioting. The Romans are going to come in here. They're going to shut us down. We're in danger of being under city lockdown, guys. The mayor's probably walking around saying, guys, how did all this start? Someone's like, well, Demetrius like, held a guild meeting, and he's like, we're losing money. And the next thing you know, everybody's rioting. Half these guys don't know why they're here. Everybody's just angry. And they're all shouting to Artemis now. The mayor goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. He goes, has, has the church ever done anything to you? And everybody's like, well, no. Wait, wait, did the church say anything negative? Did they like say anything bad about our goddess? And everybody's like, well, no. And he goes, hold on. He goes, you're going to be brought up on charge. He goes, there's no reason for us because they haven't done anything. He goes, guys, you'll have to pursue this the legal way. And he goes, well, if I bring it up in court, he goes, what charge am I going to bring up? He's like, what are they doing? Well, they're not buying my stuff anymore. He goes, you've got to be kidding, guys. And so the mayor shuts us down. He goes, you're going to bring down the iron fist of Rome upon us. And he goes, these Christians haven't done anything against them. He goes, you can take it to court. And they all realize nothing will hold up in court. It's the way the church has acted. This moment reminds me of the trial of Jesus. They constantly are trying to bring up witnesses against him, and nobody is saying the same thing. And Pilate looks at Jesus, and he goes, there's no charges against this man. He goes, you got nothing on him. And Jesus remains silent. And here we see these riot happening with charges against the church, and the church has been blameless for what has happened in this. Uh, a couple of fill-in-the-blanks, and I want to pray that this is who we become as a church, that this is who we become when we grow up, that this is who we're like. And I want you to follow this. In your notes, I wrote down, what are we known for? Having gone through that whole story, what were we known for? There are a couple of things I want you to catch about the church in Ephesus and what they were doing well. Number one, this was a church who was on mission. This was a church who was on mission in the church. And in verse 26, it says this, you see in here how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray a great number of people here. The church was on mission and more and more people are following the way every day. What, what does it mean to be on mission? What, what, what mission are you talking about? This is the great commission. In your notes next to this, you can write down Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 19, tells the story of Jesus after he has been crucified, after he raises from the grave, he walks with his disciples for 40 days, and he simply looks at them and says, now all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. And so here's what I'm going to do with all my power, with all my authority. He goes, I'm sending you. The disciples have got to be like, whoa, there's not a better plan than that. And he goes, no, no, no. He goes, you are now going to go do everything you've seen me do. You're going to become like me. You're going to spend time with me. And now you're ready to go make disciples. He goes, I'm sending you out. You go make disciples of all nations. He goes, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to baptize them. Meaning once they accept the Holy Spirit and receive the Holy Spirit, I want you to baptize them and welcome them into the church family. 
and then I want you to teach them everything that I have taught you. Teach them the way. And he goes, this is what we're about. This is the commission that Jesus gave the church. It is our mission to this day to go make disciples. Because as John chapter, wrote in chapter 3 out uh, of the book of John, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that anyone who believes in him would not perish, meaning would not die, but would have everlasting life. You see, you and I have been forever separated from God by our sin, by the things we do against him. God does have a charge to bring up against us, each and every one of us because of our sins. And yet, God didn't want to spend eternity separated from us. He didn't want us to die. And he goes, I want to give them my Holy Spirit. I want to give them eternal life. And so he sent down Jesus to pay the price for our sins. And he died upon the cross. And he rose from the grave to show that he had power over life and death. That he could truly give us eternal life. And he goes, but it's not just for you. It's for the entire world. So you got to go. You got to go make disciples. It's why we're here 2,000 years later across the globe from Jerusalem. Because men and women went out and spread the gospel. And they told us the good news of Jesus. You see, if you are a Christian, it's because somebody told you about the good news of Jesus. And you received his Holy Spirit. You asked forgiveness for your sins. And you now have eternal life in Christ. And now that you're part of that, you're part of a mission, a bigger picture that's not just about yourself, but you and I are supposed to go spread this mission to the world. Make disciples of all nations. Baptize them and teach them this is the way. Everything that Jesus taught us, that's the mission. And now churches around the world are on mission and doing this. And we have different methodologies and different ways about going about this. Some, some churches are great at sending people, like, like the church of Antioch that we read about in the book of Acts. We don't read about them doing anything else except for they grabbed Paul and Barnabas and goes, you guys go plant churches. And they went, and they were great sending churches. They would send people to different parts of the world. There are, there are other churches like the church in Jerusalem who is great at discipling. You see, whenever there was a big issue or a fight about theology, like we read in Acts chapter 15, the church in Jerusalem would come down and they would make a ruling on it because they were big on doctrine and they would teach about doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. This is what you have to believe and who you have to be. And then there were churches like Philippi. Philippi gathered together and it was a very small church, but it was wealthy. And so they just poured money into different mission projects and they funded all of Paul's future mission projects. But not only that, but when the church in Jerusalem was under famine and starving, they said, let's get together, let's raise money, let's give them food, let's do something about it. And all of these churches were on mission, but in their own way. And I want to talk to you about how Ephesus was on mission. Because of all of these churches... I think if we're going to reach this area, if we're going to reach Bailey in the Rocky Mountain region, we've got to be a lot like Ephesus and how they act and what they do. Guys, it's kind of like the army. The church is kind of like their army. There are different functions in the army. There, there are those who focus on equipping. There are those who focus on, uh, on, on being on the front lines. There are those who focus on infiltration, being behind enemy lines. And Ephesus had a different focus which I think is going to be the focus that's needed for us to change the way that our culture, that our city sees the church. At the beginning of this message, I said, what if we actually changed the impression that the church has of our, in our city? How do we go about changing the way that people see us from that's the church up there to these are the people living in the way? and they love God, and they love their neighbors, what would it look like for us to fulfill our mission in the context and the place that God has put us here in Bailey, Colorado? And I think there's some keys that we pick up on the scripture, which is going to be really important for us. Number one is this in your notes, or number four. I don't know what number we're on. The next one is this. The people were pro-Jesus, not anti-everything else. The people were pro-Jesus, not anti-everything else. Did you pick up on that in verse 37? It says, listen, you brought these men here. They haven't robbed your temple. They haven't blasphemed, meaning they haven't spoken anything about your goddess. You see, in this day and age, that temple stood against everything you were against as a Christian. Everything you were against as a believer in Jesus Christ. 
It was the center of sexual depravity. It was the center of satanic worship. It was the center of everything wrong with culture and everything going in the wrong way. And yet, for three years, we see that the church at Ephesus never protested it. They never spoke against it. They didn't have to. Because when Paul came to Ephesus, he didn't speak out against other things. He simply spoke about the way of Jesus. So when the people began to riot, the mayor came to them and goes, what do you got against these Christians? And they're like, well, nothing. They're just not buying our stuff anymore. And there was nothing they could bring up against them. They simply said, listen, these Christians have changed our culture and changed our city because they're different. They walk in a different way than everybody else. And that demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power through changed lives, it's changing everything. You see, I don't, they, they haven't camped out. They haven't done all these things. They were simply pro-Jesus. And I want you to know, this is from Paul, their pastor of three years, was the same Paul who wrote like a third of the New Testament about all the things that if you are in the way, this is what you cannot do any longer. This is what has to be out of your life. This is what you have to be against. And this temple was anti-conservative. It was anti-purity. It was satanic in its nature. And don't you stand up against that as a church? Don't you protest that? Don't you speak against something? See, what I've learned is this. You cannot impose the way of Jesus upon those who do not know Jesus. I'm from Texas, and I had a Texan pastor growing up, and there was an old Texanism that he used to say about the church. And he simply said this. He goes, you can't expect the pigs to act like the sheep. And I'm like, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> It was years before I figured out, he was saying, you cannot expect someone who does not have Jesus in their life, who does not have the Holy Spirit, to act like they're following the way. Why? Because they're not following the way. You can't expect those who do not know Jesus to follow him, which means that first, before anything else, before we can teach them and baptize them, we have to be pro-Jesus before anything else. We have to first win people to Jesus, not against everything else in the world. It's the methodology in which we win our culture you see, to be pro-Jesus, the pro-Jesus way people never gave the people of Ephesus a reason to hate them, a reason to think that they were against them. You see, I want to do Jesus in such a way, and I know that sounds weird, but I want to do this Jesus thing as a church in such a way that other people in our culture and in our context actually want to abandon their old ways because they see there's a better way in the way of Jesus. Where, where people believe that this is a church that they can come to. Why? Because they never spoke against me. Because they never made me feel like I was on the outside. Because they never made me feel evil or less than. They loved me like Jesus and they loved me like a neighbor. And that's why the church in Ephesus grew so numerous is they spread Jesus in a way that those who are broken felt like they could come in and find answers in life. And if we want to be a church where the lost are found and the broken are restored, then the lost and the broken have to be welcome here. Which means that the way that we live as we go out there has to be in the way so that they can get out of their way and find hope. Because if the broken can't come here, then there is no hope. And we have to be a church of hope. And I imagine as people come in, they got to be thinking, you know, I can't imagine they agree with my lifestyle. Nobody in there acts like this or does these things. But they've never made me feel less than. They've never made me feel unwelcome. They loved me, and I want whatever it is they have, and I want in and they know that when they want in, we say, welcome. It was what's made the church in Ephesus stand out. They were pro-Jesus, not anti-everything else. To phrase it another way, they were known for who they followed, not what they were against. They were known for who they followed, not what they were against. You see, Jesus showed love. He offered them love. And then he says, would you like to join my team? Would you like to know the wholeness and the hope and the peace and the love that I've come to give? 
And friends, I believe that we are going to change the culture of Bailey, Colorado. I believe that we are going to change the entire culture of the mountain region. And this is the way. That we would be more about Jesus than anything else. And for those of you who think we're going to start watering down the gospel, you have not been paying very good attention. We have been reading through the book of Acts, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word by word. We don't leave anything out. It does not matter how uncomfortable it is. We do not water down the way. But as we read the book of Acts, haven't you noticed this whole book has been about including people who never should have been included? And it comes to that again and again and again. And we've got to catch that this is what the gospel is about, is bringing in people who are on the outside who never should have felt welcome. Because at the core of it, you and I never should have been welcomed into the family of Jesus. So why would we keep anybody else out? Of what we have freely received, we freely give which means that this is about life change that changed other people's lives. You see, this is what they're experiencing in Ephesus. People's lives are being changed, and they're going out changing other people's lives because they are demonstrating a Holy Spirit-filled life. And Paul just spoke about Jesus. And he goes, I'm not going to speak about Artemis. I'm just going to give you an alternative. Has that way left you feeling empty? Has that way left you feeling alone? Have you been chasing your own way and just feeling lost and miserable for all of these years? Then I want to give you a new way. And 2,000 years later, we still study this story. Why? Because he gave people another way. And the key is for you and I, as believers filled with the Holy Spirit, to walk in the way of Jesus consistently when we are outside of the church so that other people would see our good lives, would see the light within us and say, I want in. First Peter chapter something says, live your life before the unbelievers that they would glorify your father. That they would see your good deeds. And know who he is. Just a warning. That means you'll have to give up your shrines. That means you'll have to give up some of your scrolls. Can I tell you, the goddesses that I followed before I knew Jesus died a long time ago. There's nothing left there. And Jesus is still on mission. And he invites us to join the movement and the mission of Jesus Christ to offer love to those who are far away, to those who are broken and hurting and lost and feeling like the church has beat them down. And friends, if we are going to reach this region in Bailey, Colorado, and the Rocky Mountains, our, our first task is to redeem the reputation of Jesus Christ, who has never done anything wrong, but we haven't been the best. Christians have done a lot of wrong things over the years. And I mean going back way before you and I were around. And the reputation of the church isn't so hot. And one of the first things we need to do is redeem the reputation of the church so that people look and say, is it me or are they about loving God and loving their neighbor? And we say, that's the way, that's his Jesus. It was always hid his. So the question is, what will you and I be known for today? Maybe for you, for the very first time, you can actually feel the Holy Spirit pounding on your heart. And you're like, what, what's this happening inside of me right now? I just want to let you know that's God working inside of you because he's trying to invite you in. The book of Revelation chapter three describes Jesus knocking on the door of our hearts. It's an analogy, but it's the best description out there because there's this moment where you just feel your heart pounding and you can feel Jesus wanting into your life. And you may be feeling that right now. And friends, we want to let you know, regardless of how far away you feel from God, you are welcome. Not just here, but in the family of God. Because there is a God who loved you so much that he gave his only son to come and die and forgive us for what we've done. And he rose from the grave to show us that he is a master of life and death and can give us eternal life. And if he is knocking on the door of your heart today, I simply want to encourage you, let him in. And you can do that with this simple prayer. God, I, I'm not even sure if I know who you are. 
But if you really want a relationship with me, then I want a relationship with you. Jesus, would you forgive me for everything I've done wrong in this life? And would you show me a better way? Lead me to you and put your spirit inside of me so that I can walk with you. For the rest of us, it's an invitation to join God on mission. If you're interested in knowing more about Jesus, more about accepting him as your Lord and Savior, if you're interested in knowing more about how to be baptized, there's a little tear-off card on your notes. Write your name down, check whatever boxes apply to you today, drop it in the offering boxes up front and say, okay, I'm in. I don't know what this means, but I want to know more. And come and join us as we make the name of Jesus Christ famous. In Bailey, Colorado, throughout the Rocky Mountain region and around the world. Father God, thank you for this story today. Help us to join you on mission. Would we be known for being pro-Jesus? Would we be known for following you? God, for those of us who still have idols, who still have scrolls in our lives, would we give them up so that we can live such good lives in front of the unbelievers that they might come and know your glory too. Thanks for loving us and welcoming us into your family. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As always, some of our pastors and elders will be up front to pray for you guys. We'd love the privilege of praying for you. Would you come?
one quick announcement so you don't need to sit down if you don't want to but right after second service here we're going to have our annual business meeting uh, we're going to go over a few things and excitingly we're going to welcome new members at Crow Hill Bible Church so I had to catch my breath that's what I get for jumping around anyway um, lost my train of thought greet someone I had to look at you to get my train of thought back greet someone this morning who is pro Jesus and come back in, how many minutes, Dale? 11. Okay, come back in 11 minutes. <laughs> That's what I get for asking the elder, but come back in 11 minutes, and we will begin our annual business meeting. Thank you, and have a blessed day. Have a good week, guys.